Buongiorno a tutti, benvenuti alla Biblioteca Bredense, di cui ho il piacere di essere direttore generale. Io ho saputo stamattina che la maggior parte di voi parlano, parla inglese invece di italiano. In that case, I will revert to my mother tongue and speak a few brief words. I was told not more than three minutes, which for me is almost impossible, um, but in English. I am indeed the Director General of this library and of the museum next door, the Pinacoteca, but what is not generally remembered is that I'm also a designer. I was uh, an award-winning designer in Canada before coming to study the Architectural Association where I took my diploma in architecture um, with uh, Rem Kohlhaus, with uh, Peter Wilson, with Raoul Bunchkoten, with uh, Zaha Hadid, Nigel Coates, the grand old days of the 80s at the AA. And I have spent my life actually in the world of design in its broadest sense, because what do we have here? We have a world in which all the material gestures we make, all the traces we leave, have a semiotic impact, have a, have a meaning. And the way we create spaces, the way we use materials, the way we make choices about color, about medium, we know every one of those acts even though they are nonverbal, have great power. This room has a power of its own. If it were narrower, it would be a different room and a different feeling. If it were shorter, if it were, if they'd cut and put a ceiling overhead, we all know that everything we do as designers has a meaning. The difficulty for us all, though, is to listen. One thing that is imperative when we have this kind of responsibility for leaving traces that can shape lives is to listen to those whose lives we are going to shape or that we will have an impact on. And that's something that is done less than it should be. And I think in this time, particularly the use of rooms, of spaces, of our, the choices in which we that we make, uh, I think we have to remember our responsibility to listen and our responsibility to open dialogues, to open out and not close down. I think this uh, series by Prada is exemplary. I think the team that's put it together is brilliant because this is what libraries and museums are about. It's not about the stuff on the walls, nor is it really about the traces we have here that are sources of inspiration their sources of consolation, but the real marrow, as one would say in 16th century theology, the real marrow of our work is creating a critical, open society where we can still say what needs to be said and debate and discuss without being closed down, either by uh, political powers, religious powers. I think this room over us is Maria Teresa Habsburg, we are here in a room that was created at the height of the Enlightenment and, like the Pinacotech, is dedicated to the values of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment which saw the writing of the Universal, um, the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Humanity. It saw the French Revolution. It saw the American Revolution and the writing of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. We are here still in the heart of the Enlightenment. And I think those values still are values that every designer, every architect, every scholar, and every museum and library director has to take to heart. Because without them, we won't have the diversity, we won't have the sustainability, and we will not be able to keep this planet going much longer, which we can see already is greatly in crisis. So let's uh, just remember, perhaps I'll close with Shakespeare, um, that our work is about letting things speak and being listened to. That there are tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stone, and good 
in everything. I would not change it. Thank you. Thank you to James Bradburn for this fantastic start of the day. Welcome everyone, my name is Simone Farrezin and together with my partner Andrea Trimarchi, we are the founders of a design studio in Milan and Rotterdam called Forma Fantasma, but we are also the creator of this edition of Prada Frames. We have been practicing in the field of design since 2009, but we have also always been pretty interested in the ethical implication that the act of design entails. In light of this interest and in constant collaboration with the Prada team, we conceived this symposium. With Prada, we share a common interest in the dissemination of knowledge. And in fact, before uh, talking more about the concept of Prada Frames, I would like to thank a person who supported this project since the beginning, but also trusted us in this process. And this person is Mrs. Prada. Prada Frames is a symposium that investigates the complex relationship between the environment and design outcomes. Most probably many of you today are here because of the Furniture Fair. What better occasion could there be to gather here to discuss about the problematics and the possibilities of design? We believe it is crucial to acknowledge the legacy of industrial production as a fundamental source for the expertise and agency of the designer while also addressing its historic contribution to environmental instability. The symposium brings together designers, architects, curators, producers, but also scientists, anthropologists, activists, and legal and economic experts. The transdisciplinary notion of the symposium, it is not just a way to increase the scale and depth of the research, but it is also an ethical position, one that respects the expertise, lived experience, and skills of individuals in institutions in other fields. Considering the fact that Prada Frame is running in parallel to the Salon del Mobile, we thought it was pertinent to start this first edition talking about the ecosystem of the forest, the governance of the timber industry, but also to extend further, to look at forests also as places inhabited by a multiplicity of different species, both human and more than human. Today, the ever-increasing consumption of wooden products makes the timber industry one of the largest globally and among the most impactful in our everyday lives. Many of our furniture, clothing, packaging, fuels, fertilizers are sourced from some of the world's most complex ecosystems. In three days and with two sessions per day, we will also extend beyond the forest and involve practitioners that have an expansive idea of what design is and also will help us rethink the term sustainability. And of course, what better location could we have asked to be here at the Bradense Library? This is a perfect spot for several reasons. James already mentioned several. Um, I think one that is obvious is that we are within a forest. If you think about these bookshelves made of walnut, the books are made of paper fibers. Everything here is about the timber industry and forest too. But it is also about dissemination of knowledge. And in fact, we will use what we will put forward in these three days as a compendium of knowledge that will become part of the curriculum of the entering students of the geodesign department we are running in uh, Eindhoven, at the Design Academy in Eindhoven. We hope this will open and inspire other institutions to join forces in addressing the topics we will discuss all together under a multidisciplinary approach. So if there are educators, and I know there are, please feel free to appropriate whatever it is put forward and make it part of your own curriculum. As an extension of the symposium, most probably you spot in the vitrines at the entrance, a selection of books from the library, all dedicated to the vegetal world. If you haven't looked at the books, please feel free to do so. They are wonderful publications. And I would like also to acknowledge and thank the Biblioteca Universitaria di Pavia for allowing us to film the beautiful Dendrografia in Suberica, which is an exceptional archive of all types of wooden uh, specimens from the Lombardy regions from 1793 by Carlos Tomaski. When you were coming in the room, you most probably spotted the film on screen. But let's start the day with the first speaker, Andres Hake. Andres is an architect, researcher, and curator whose work explores architecture as the entanglement of bodies, technologies, and environments. 
He's the founder of the architectural agency Office for Political Innovation. He's also director of Columbia University Advanced Architectural Design Program and chief curator of the 13th Shanghai Biennale, Bodies of Water. Andres will introduce a few of his projects and current research. The work of Andres is powerful in its capacity to unpack a lot of the complexities and sometimes even the absurdities of architecture, ecology, and politics. His work is also a strong example of how expansive and rigorous the practice of architecture can be today. Andres, please welcome on stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simone, for this presentation. Thank you very much, Andrea, as well. Uh, I would like to talk about silica, and not really talk about silica, but also acknowledge that silica, we are silica in many ways. Our expanded bodies very much depend on us uh, becoming silica. And that's something that we see as part of the making of modernity. This is the first photograph that was ever taken in one of the most photo in a part of one of the most photographed modern architecture pieces, the, the basement of the Barcelona Pavilion. But precisely, it was never photographed before uh, because in order for the pavilion to work, its basement needs to be hidden. It needs to remain invisible. What we see here, I would claim, is a forest. It's what modernity made of forest. And it's actually a piece of glass that was broken from the upper floor, exactly from this part here. This is the Barcelona Pavilion, composed as a two-story building that has one part that needs to be uh, hidden for the other one to be perceived as this kind of fantasy of the possibility of ecosystemic parts uh, from being removed, segregated, and purified of their entanglement. That is what I think that is now cracking. So the photograph of the, of the glass cracking, in a way, is also telling us that this is a system that is incredibly fragile. A system, the system of modernity, a way of dealing with forests, with silica, with life, that somehow is coming to a moment of crack, and there's many other forms of life that are growing in those cracks. This is the Barcelona Pavilion that we could acknowledge, but this is a section that probably you have never seen before. And this is the place where Cat Niebla live. For me, Cat Niebla, is probably the most important outcomes of modernity. She lived here in the basement. The cosmopolitical composition of the pavilion required someone to come here to remove the mice. Mice were not part of the Barcelona Pavilion project, according to those that were studying mice. So Kat Niebla, that you see here, was taken here to work at night in the, in the upper part of the pavilion to make sure that those ecosystems could be controlled and that uh, mice could be evacuated from modernity. But because, of course, the making of modernity need to be seen as a given, Kat Niebla was taken during the day to the basement where she could remain invisible. By being in the darkness of the basement, Kat Niebla developed uh, atrophia macular, and basically she became blind. So she could no longer see mice, but she could see, basically, she could sense the presence of others, others mice. For me, this is basically what uh, the challenge that we have now as designers. To think of architecture not as something, that, or design, not as something that resolves problems, but something that works compositionally, that is basically the making of environments, or it's architecture, design, is environment in itself. And that talks about the reflexivity of design. We produce design, but also we're produced by the designs we're part of. And that's, of course, part of a change of an ecosystemical way of thinking that is probably putting in crisis the notions of nature that we had in the past. We body architecture now, and that means that we're forest in the, way, in the same way that we're silica, and that architecture is no longer resolving problems or addressing uh, functional issues, but rather recomposing life, recomposing the way more than human lives are entangled to each other and produce, co-produce each other. And in, in my opinion, uh, architecture now, design now, is really that. It's just contributing to recomposing ecosystems. And that's what uh, we did in the Barcelona Pavilion. But let me talk more directly about glass and how glass is forest, how glass actually 
is a very particular way to be violent with forest. This is the first image that was produced by D-Box under the direction, the artistic direction of uh, Matthew Bannister uh, to produce the 432 Park Avenue building, the first high-end tow pencil tower built in New York. This image, as you see, there's this guy on a uh, chair that was recently auctioned when, the, uh, when the, the image was produced, owning a view, owning a view like if it was a piece of art, a work art that is produced just by the presence of a square glass. The building, it's just the repetition of this conceptual image. It's just the addition, many times, of the same possibility of owning the landscape by owning the interior. Actually, this is what is owned. This distant landscape in Susquehanna Valley, this forest, this natural forest that's still struggling to accommodate the infrastructures that make possible that building, is what is owned by owning the interior. And that's something that, of course, responds to the fact that since the 1970s, New York lost the capacity to have zip containers in its harbor, and therefore the harbor could no longer, New York Harbor could no longer compete with Elizabeth, New Jersey. And therefore, there was a new industry that was developing the city, something that uh, Michael Bloomberg would explain, like the possibility to attract billionaires through real estate. And of course, in order to do that, a number of designs were needed. Designs that had to do with tax evasion, the possibility, the regulation that allowed to buy real estate properties in New York through LLC companies that would hide uh, the name of those that were owning these apartments, tax evasions uh, or deductions that were applied not like in the welfare tradition to, to redistribute wealth, uh, but actually to compensate or to, to uh, uh, insti uh, uh, instigate billionaires to invest in the city. And actually that's what was expressed uh, during the also Europe, during the COVID uh, crisis, that actually those uh, uh, those evolutions in the West taxation was happening internationally was also affecting the way bodies were uh, 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 collectively produced uh, within the European Union as well. Actually, it's interesting to see that when the paradise and the, and the other uh, cases of tax evasion were massively uh, publicized through uh, 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 journalistic research, the way in the press uh, tax uh, uh, havens were, uh, were depicted through architecture was with this colonial architecture in remote islands. But actually, when we see how the European Union was struggling to define what a tax haven was, we see that basically whenever they define, or in the European uh, Union was defined, what were the conditions that the tax haven uh, that would make a location a tax haven, basically they ended up including Turkey, Malaysia, Jersey, United Kingdom, Panama, Japan, Chile, Netherlands, Israel, Guatemala, Belgium, Ireland, uh, France, Russia, Netherlands, Italy, Sweden, Gibraltar. Basically most countries, most developed countries were actually tax havens. And the form that it took is this. Architecture was producing basically this possibility of degrounding a parts of society and removing them from the cost of collect collective existence. But that comes with the environment, with owning the environment. And actually for me, it's, it was also always very intriguing that a big part, like 70% of the views in this apartment, is really not the skyline of the city as it was in the penthouses of the 1940s and 50s. It was actually the sky, the air. And the air was the result, of course, of a number of environmental calibrations that were also coming through design. This is actually not just a metaphor, but it's actually a plan, a plot to transform the air in New York. And that starts with the perception and the detailing of the building that was using this very expensive light wall, ultra clear glass that was calibrated so that the spectrum of the, the blue part of the spectrum of the light could be maximized uh, to the way, this is ultra clear glass on the left uh, and regular ordinary glass to the right. Ultra clear glass is basically a glass that is reduces oxide fer uh, uh, um, uh, ferro, um, iron oxide. So basically it can be removed, this kind of green tone in it. Uh, but actually there's only a few locations where the silica 
that is needed to produce ultra clear glass can be produced. One of them is Illinois. And actually, these are the forests of Illinois, a few of the very, the, one of the very few that still remain. And that was the location uh, where the uh, Kikapu and the, and the so uh, um, First Nations were actually developing a form of life that could allow them to live in the forest and coexist with a number of species uh, in a way that was sustainable in the long run. The silica actually is like a sponge. Uh, its rounded grains allows the water to go through and it allows the trees to basically be rooted and have access to organic nutrients that can be found in the cavities between the different grains of the silica. The silica is actually making possible one of the highest uh, uh, concentrations uh, of uh, biodiversity on Earth. And that was actually, through modernity, extracted and turned into this. This is Ottawa, one of the biggest sites of silica extraction, where the silica that is, produced, where the, that is needed to produce ultra clear glass is now extracted. So basically, we see here the confrontation of two cultures, the culture of multi-species alliance and the culture of exploitation, the culture that is still growing in the cracks of the silica and in the cracks of modernity, and the culture of modernity. And I think this is the moment in which we are. This is kind of the, the two images that we're inhabiting now and where probably where our action is needed. This is silica. You see how the grains of silica, incredibly strong, allowed for these holes to remain in it. And basically, that is what is turned into this, removing a big part of the life that was in it, that grows in it. To produce ultra clear glass, uh, it's needed 70% uh, uh, more energy than to produce ordinary glass. And a big part of that energy comes from fracking. Glass and fracking comes hand by hand. Glass and the exploitation of, uh, and the possibility of producing glass was a fundamental part of the development of the Midwest in the US since the 1930s. But not only that, to produce fracking, to extract the, the non-conventional gas, sale gas from fracking, it's basically directly connected to 30,000 miles of aquifers that have been polluted in the last decade in Susquehanna Valley. Susquehanna Valley contains, is one of the most, uh, the most important, the, 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 the biggest accumulation of sale gas in the world. And it's actually coming from the evolution from the basically deposit of fossil uh, remains of the forest that once occupied this area. When we think of forest, we basically have to think that it's also related to gas. Gas is forest, forest in history. And actually what is surprising is that the use of ultra clear glass automatically gives you two points in the LEED certificate in one of these seals of sustainability quality. So we see here another fracture probably the, the, the culture of ecology has to do much more with composition than just with the maths of carbon sequestration or calculation. It's not really about calculation uh, within the same conceptual frame, but it's actually about rethinking the way different species uh, negotiate their coexistence and their alliances. Architectural detailing, for me, is a form of socio-territorial reconstruction. And it's there where we can see the violence of modernity and the violence of things like this. Actually, that project, this project here, did not stop in the glass. It also had to do with the earth that surrounded it. And it's very important to see that it was part of the project of Bloomberg to eliminate NOx, the yellow particles, the yellow gas in the, in the sky of New York, from its sky. Basically, through the Clean Heat Project, Bloomberg got rid of the NOx, this kind of yellowish part of the sky that was very common for those that were aware of, were familiar with the sky of New York in the 1980s and 90s. You will probably remember this kind of yellowish color in the sky. Now it's no longer like that, right? It's blue. But it's blue because basically, uh, at the same time that the boilers were uh, changed from uh, diesel oils to gas oils, basically that allowed to move the pollution from the place where uh, gas, where, where uh, oil was burned, New York, to the place where gas was extracted, Susquehanna Valley. And actually this came at the same time that Cuomo banned horizontal fracking in New York State. And as a result of this, fracking started to happen in Susquehanna Valley very intensively. 
And we've been working for a decade now with people that are independently measuring the quality of the air in Susquehanna Valley. And basically, we can see that the NOx, basically, uh, that was removed from New York was automatically sent to uh, Pennsylvania, to the area where the gas was extracted. And that is radically what design was doing in the, in the 2000s. And that is what is produced, this kind of elegant glass that we can see in the uh, 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 pencil towers in New York. This is, uh, paradoxically, uh, the silica that is also introduced in the chimneys, in the pipes that get deep into the, into the earth to extract the gas, so that gas can flow through, this hole, through their holes. So basically, the same capacity of the silica to allow life to flow through their holes is now being mobilized to extract the, the gas miles deep into the earth. This is, again, a frag pad. We see how the frag pad, even if carefully landscaped, is identified as a void in the forest. The same void that allows to own the forest uh, from an apartment in New York. This is part of those interiors. This is actually what can be done to real estate. But this is the way people living in Susquehanna Valley perceive fracking. The water in their aquifers get mixed with methane, and they can burn in it their taps. And this is the way that those, that gas is perceived by those that have the capacity to invest on it, turn into an asset. This is actually the digital systems that are used to, uh, through Predix, make it possible to invest now in uh, gas. And actually, this is the divide that we're talking about. Inequality is also a project, a kind of divide in the project of ecology. These are the properties on top that are living on the Marcellus cell, turn into an asset through technology, through apartments, through regulations, through all these forms of design. And these are the lots that are on top of it. But this is something that is invisible. It's as invisible as the glass. There's no way to be in an apartment and sense this violence. And that's what our work has been about and what we've been doing in the last years, to try to find ways uh, to make it possible to design across scales and to connect locations that are very distant and kind of organized so ones are very visible and others incredibly invisible to reconstruct the, the ecosystemical uh, entanglement life is made of. And this is also something that has to do with perception. I would like to show now, or to allow you to hear what fracking means. Uh, maybe it can be played now. This is a reconstruction that we did by placing sensors in an area of five miles around a fracking site during the time that it was being fracked. You can hear the gas flowing at the same time that the rock is being fractured, is breaking. You can probably feel it in your skin. And surprisingly, this is something that was described by people of the Sioux tribe that live 20 miles from the fracking sites as something that they can feel. They can touch the earth and they feel this violence, the violence of the glass, or the violence of real estate, the violence of these modern ecosystems breaking the stone so that breaking the rock through pressure so that the gas can flow from Susquehanna Valley, destroying part of the life of the forest and be channeled to New York City. I would invite you to close your eyes and try to feel it through your skin.
So for me, the question is, how can we change our, our bodies? How can we really recombine our bodies with other things? How, we span, how can we expand our sensitivities so that we can really fill the entanglement with all the forms of life that we're part of? And in a way, I think that's the challenge of the times that we live in. We're in a time probably where we have to grow in these cracks of modernity, and those other forms of life will also produce us as differently as the Gat Niebla was produced by the Barcelona Pavilion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andres, for this very powerful presentation. I'm honored to have you here. Thank you. I'm Andrea Trimarchi, and I'm a co-founder of Forma Fantasma, together with Simone, and of course, also creator of this first edition of uh, Prada Frames. Uh, as Andres, we share a strong belief in the power of education, and as such, I would like to introduce three graduating students of the Geodesign Master Program of the Design Academy Eindhoven, Ayla, Yassine, and Connor. Since 2020, as former Fantasma, we have been the head of uh, this new department, uh, it's called Geodesign, and these two year department uh, programs aims to equip students with the tools to explore the social, economic, territorial, and geopolitical forces shaping design today. The students today with us are actually in their final year, they're having their graduation next uh, week, so I'm very grateful they took the time to, to come here in this very busy time. And today they're gonna share some of the early work they did uh, in the first year. We will, start with, uh, we will start with Connor Cook, who is a researcher and designer. His presentation will explore the gamification of landscape in rural China through the key studies of Alipay and Forest. Then we will have Yassine Ben Abdallah, who is a designer and researcher. Um, his presentation will look at the forest as a space to hide and find refuge. Unfortunately, uh, Yassin cannot be with us today because he had uh, quite a serious accident, but he sent us his presentation, so again, very grateful he did it. And we will finish with Ayla Kekia, who is trained as graphic designer. Her presentation will, look, uh, not, will not look at the forest directly, rather it will address the complex ties between the natural environment and the man-made by tracing the journey of the sea walnut and non-human migratory history. Connor, please go ahead. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Andrea. So my name is Connor, and today, along with my, my colleagues, we're going to be exploring a bit how some of the topics being explored here are being articulated in an, in an educational context as well. So I'm going to be presenting work today from a studio uh, called Technogeographies, which was led by Martina Muzzi last year. And as you can hear in the name, the studio was trying to intend to these entangled entanglement between technological development and geographical transformation. So for this, I looked at this landscape, um, which in and of itself is nothing new. This is a tree planting project in an arid region in northern China. Um, similar projects have been under, underway since the 1950s, uh, state-sponsored pro projects planting trees in order to try to combat desertification in the area. But um, as of 2016, there underwent a profound transformation in how this program was um, being implemented. And that is due to this app. So this is um, a gamified add-on to the Alipay payment services app, known as Alipay and Forest. And Alipay is used very similar to Apple Pay. Um, many people use it for everyday transactions and payments in China. And what this app does is it attempts to sort of gamify these transactions um, in order to, according to the company, introduce um, low carbon lifestyles. Um, so examples of what this might be, as you can see there, is um, maybe taking one of Alipay's bike sharing uh, services to work or um, selling some of your old clothes on one of Alipay's subsidiary platforms. Um, and for each of these activities, you get an amount of green energy points, which roughly correspond to the amount of carbon dioxide that's offset um, by the activity in question. And these points are used basically to nurture and harvest a virtual tree, which when it grows big enough, the company will uh, plant a real tree in one of these desert regions. And I'll loop back to this, but what's really crucial about this case study and what my research was looking into is the fact that all of the activities that are deemed legitimate on this app are also activities that happen to benefit the company's uh, bottom line. So, um, this has been almost universally praised. In 2019, it won the uh, UN Champions of the Earth Award, and it's led so far to 
the planting of over 100 million trees and over 500 million active users of the app. So the scale is really massive. But my research was looking into a bit more complicated narrative behind this, um, which is namely this. This relationship is what I was very interested in, which is sort of the relationship between the user experience design of this gamified system and the redesign of a landscape, in essence. Um, so what gamification is for people who aren't familiar, it's the transformation of formerly non-game services like financial planning or dieting into gamified systems by use of sort of um, psychological tactics like reward mechanisms and leaderboard points and whatnot. And what I became interested in is how the design decisions made to build this app, to make this app kind of addictive, are also the design decisions that in fact are informing the design of this landscape. And this is one of these sort of entanglements and spillover effects um, across scales of design is one of the things that we're really actively exploring in the geodesign um, program. So what I became interested in is if the sort of design decisions that are built around the human psyche and in increasing sort of profit for the company um, are applied to the landscape, how does that encounter with the ecological reality of this landscape? And it's too early to be entirely sure, but so far research over the last 70 years has proven that similar tree planting programs in the region have pretty much universally led to a decline in water level, water table levels in the region, um, which counterintuitively accelerates the desertification processes. And the other sort of implication that I found very interesting, and this is very much a speculation on my part, but I was interested in the way in which such a system sort of lays in place the groundwork in the architecture for a future peer-to-peer -peer, um, emissions trading uh, scheme. So already it has all of the elements, like a preliminary carbon accounting um, system, a carbon trading system where you can buy and steal points from your friends. Um, it puts these things in place. It's presented as a game now, but uh, last year China introduced for the first time a national emissions trading scheme, and it doesn't take so much imagination to um, imagine this on an individual level. And what I want to highlight here that I find quite interesting is exactly this notion of what counts on the project and how if a platform like Alipay were to be the intermediary for some national emissions trading system, how that in turn might lead to further entrenchment of power um, in this platform. So if I ride my own bike to work, I don't get any points for this. Or if I grow my own food at home, I don't get any points for this either. So, it raises more questions than it does answers, um, but for me, this is what I found quite interesting. So for my own um, projects, I work a lot with uh, video game design, and I think what the project does really nicely is it speaks to the importance of the sort of aesthetic and emotional relationship that we have to climate change and to sort of feeling good about our actions. It feels great to plant a tree. It's something that you can point at and sort of feel good about your work as, as much as it feels good to play a game. So in my work, I didn't want to sort of reject the game entirely, but I wanted to reject this particular manifestation. And instead, my research turned into um, looking at competitive esports uh, gaming systems in China, which a lot of money sort of flows through these systems. Typically, people in the sort of pay-to-play model will pay to have access to the games or to have certain power-ups or abilities. So what I was trying to do is pair this sort of um, system with an alternative funding system, which is a speculative like, monetary policy known as carbon quantitative easing. I won't go into the details of that, but basically what I was wanting to do was sort of recombine these elements of the game and decarbonization um, in a way that's not exploitative towards the environment, nor leading to the further entrenchment of power in a singular platform. So that's it for, for my work. Um, next up, uh, Yassin has prepared a video in his absence, so we're going to um, play that to him. So I'll turn it over to Yassin. So thank you so much. My name is Yassin, and I'm pleased to present to you my project, Disappearing of a Nation on the Ruins of the Plantation Scene. The brief of the studio was to look at the forest as interconnected bodies which can create networks and alliances between beings and places. I turned into a familiar forest, the one of my home country, the forest of La Réunion. Réunion Island is a small volcanic island situated in the Indian Ocean. Originally uninhabited, 
the island will be colonized by France and turned into a sugar colony. Enslaved from Madagascar and the east coast of Africa will be brought and exploited into the profitable plantation of the French Empire. Territorial concessions were granted by the French East India Company to the new settlers. The concession would be given from Le Baton des Lames au Sommet des Montagnes, from the beating of the waves to the summit of the mountains. The colonial division of the island is followed by clear cutting all along the coast. Indeed, every colonial conquest needs to create terra nullius. Humans and non-humans must be brought to extinction to be able to create the landscape of the empire, the plantation. But one part of the island would remain intact. Because La Réunion is a volcanic island, the inside of it is a dense forest that even the white settlers couldn't tame. The Réunionese forest is mystical. The forest is narrated in the broader culture through legends, and most significantly through the story of the Maroons. Maroons were enslaved who escaped the forced labor in sugar plantations to regain freedom in the secrecy of the island's forests. They built a kingdom away of the settlers' gaze to reconnect with the earth and the ancestors. The term maroon comes from the Spanish word cimarron and refers to domesticated animals that became feral. The maroons were hunted down by slave hunters who would get paid by the number of severed hands brought back. They lived in the depth of the forest where they could see without being seen, going further and further in the woods until becoming forest themselves. Marooning has been one of the most active forms of resistance against the gridded system of the plantations. Facing the coercive apparatus of the slave state, the maroon secession becomes a machine of disappearance. To this day, next to nothing has been materially found about maroons. Only tales and mysticism remains in Creole culture. The forest became the sole evidence of maroon civilization. The outcome of this research had to take the form of an exhibition. Yet, I was confronted with the question of what it meant to exhibit what is supposed to stay hidden. And this is how I came to my project, Disappearing of a Nation, which claimed to be the first ethnographic exhibition about maroons in the Netherlands. I created and designed the communication of a fake exhibition, bearing in mind that the advent of ethnographic museums goes hand in hand with the colonial expansion. The exhibition of exotic artifacts, displayed in cabinets of curiosities for the Western gaze, was a way to assert the dominance of a civilized white culture compared to primitive ones. Mimicking the ethnographic exhibition was a way to question the relevance of showing to a Western audience what should remain hidden in the forest. Leaflets were distributed telling the fictional story of Western explorer the Dr. Colonize, whose expedition was able to uncover the most important collection of maroon artifact to date. Even tickets could be purchased to visit the exhibition. But when you are finally able to visit this alleged exhibition, you are welcomed by nothing. Dead leaves on the ground, pristine white podium covered by moss, are the only testament of marooning here. You are walking around this exhibition and you are not able to see anything displayed, only hearing yourself moving through the dead leaves. On each podium, a caption describes stories of disappearance. On this one, you read that in 1848, the abolition of slavery, 62,000 enslaved are freed. And yet to this day, not a single enslaved chain has been found in the island. Where are they? Perhaps in the forest. Hello everyone, my name is Ayla and today I'm going to be talking to you about Invisible Passenger which is a project I did in the context of the master program geodesign, specifically in a course called Pedagogies of the Sea, uh, headed by Angela Rui, 
which basically started with an in-depth research in the ocean or the sea. So my starting point for this project and my biggest challenge was where to start basically and where to situate myself within a space that is so vast and where the sheer scale of it makes it so difficult to access. So there's definitely an intimidating aspect to kind of try to infiltrate as such a topic. And my answer to this was looking at the ocean from a childlike perspective and to try to look at it as a kind of theater stage of some sort. And when I looked at it from this perspective of a storytelling perspective, I could start to see smaller entanglements and smaller characters that are differently interacting and where different, basically, uh, events were taking place. And the specific character I chose to focus on was the sea walnut. And the sea walnut is kind of a jellyfish, but not really, it's a stenophore, scientifically, and also called Mnemiopis lady or the comb jelly. And what's interesting about this species is that it is absolutely harmless, it is invisible, it is extremely slimy, and you can only see it at night with these kind of disco tentacles. But it is one of the most invasive species in the Mediterranean basin. So I started to look at how this species was interacting with its environment, starting with the scale that was most familiar to me, which was the human scale. So as a human and in our interaction with the shore, obviously we have highly colonized that space, but we have also endowed a highly anthropocentric perception of it. So when we think of the beach and the shore and the ocean and the sea, we think of a highly romanticized space. We think of pristine beaches and beautiful spaces and a balnear culture, which actually, with the presence of a sea walnut, is in complete opposition to that imagination. The reality is much more gooey and much more slimy, and you, when you kind of walk and stomp on them, you can feel them under your feet. And when you swim in them, you can feel their slime as you swim in the ocean. And there's a real visceral nature to that encounter. Looking at a different scale, slightly larger, I looked at an economic and ecological scale. And I started to look at diet. And essentially what this sea walnut mainly feeds on is zooplankton, which are tiny little organisms that also happen to be the main diet of fish, like tuna and codfish, and the problem is that not only does this actually harm the marine food chain and the entire ecosystem underwater, but above water, it also poses a direct threat to fisheries and the fishing industry as a whole. So then I zoomed out furthermore, and I looked at it on a global scale. And I tried to look at the different interconnections that existed to try to see why this was happening in the first place. So essentially, the sea walnut comes from the southern part of the Mediterranean, oh, sorry, the southern part of the Atlantic Ocean. And the way that they got into the Mediterranean was actually through cargo ships. Because cargo ships under water have something that is called ballast tanks. And we, basically what ballast tanks are, are empty, huge reservoirs that, fish, that, the, that cargo ships basically fill up with water in order to guarantee stability during long voyages, especially in the Atlantic Ocean. So what would happen is that these cargo ships would basically depart from a port in the Atlantic, load up on all the basically comb jelly populated water, then get to the Mediterranean basin, discharge all that water, and the sea walnuts would kind of trickle out inside. In a basin so warm as the Mediterranean and so enclosed, this was the perfect environment for the sea walnut to prosper, making it the most invasive species in that basin. So after taking a particular interest in cargo ships, I was interested in looking at the different mechanisms of the infrastructures of global trade. And what I found was this incredible list called the Harmonized Commodity Distribution and Coding System, which is essentially a list that was instilled by the World Customs Organization, which tracks every single, whoop, which tracks every single item that can be transported on top of a cargo ship. Everything from hair, everything from horses, fish, fabric, paper, you name it, it is on that list. If it is economically profitable, then it is on that list. The only things that are not on that list is everything that is below deck. So the sea walnut, while it is extremely pervasive in the Mediterranean, has an absolute invisibility to its journey. And so this list was interesting to me because to me I read it as a way in which capitalism recorded its own history and what it decided to omit from that history as well. 
And in the case of that sea walnut, that included the erasure of migratory histories and also the collateral displacement of a species that we as humans have come to define as invasive. And so my project took on the form of a performance, which we will not see today, but it was basically the output of an addition to that classification. Um, essentially, reading that language of that classification, I added upon it an annex, which basically was an additional classification of every single living organism that was actually transported on these cargo ships only above deck, sorry, below deck. In other words, the classification of invisible passengers. Thank you. Thank you, Connor, Yasin, and Ayla for the fantastic presentations. And of course, uh, good luck also with your final graduation. And thank you for joining in Milan, even if I know you're really busy. Um, our next speaker is Victor Masters, who is part of Rotor, a multidisciplinary association based in Brussels, specializing in material flows and reuse strategies. Rotor coordinates large-scale dismantling operations, collaborates in architectural projects, and realizes interior and urban design. In 2015, Roto's work was rewarded with the Global Award for Sustainable Architecture, awarded under the patronage of UNESCO. Victor will introduce modes of facilitating the circulation of reclaimed building materials. Please, let's welcome on stage Victor Masters of Rotor. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So I'm Victor Mesters from Rotor. And uh, as uh, he said, I'm going to talk about how to reuse building elements, not in a rocket science way, but in a more prag pragmatical way. So the lecture is in three parts. First, I will show you a quick insight of the history of demolition. Then I will give you some tips about how to reclaim buildings elements. And at the end, I will show you a few existing reuse dealers that we have visited in Northwestern Europe. So Rotor is a collective design practice based in Brussels and founded in 2005. We investigate the material economy through architecture and industry and develop a specific knowledge around the question of reusing building elements. This is the picture of the team two years ago. But first, let's get back in the past. During the antiquity, the Roman Empire called spolia the practice of reusing building elements. This word comes from the Latin spolions, that means peeling off the skin of an animal. So if you look closer on that image, you will see that the columns are all different made with different stones, because they were salvaged from various buildings during the conquest of Roman Empire. Then we discovered through archaeological studies that a market of salvaged materials was already existing in Pompeii, and that much of the marble used for bar counters was second hand. In 1884, pictures of reclamation yards in Paris show that this practice was still existing. You can see on, this, on the top of this image the pediment of the Palais du Louvre reclaimed by Achille Picard because of the fire of the palace two years before during the Commune de Paris. In 1928, a demolition, a demolition site was looking like that in Brussels piles of materials well sorted and carefully dismantled. And if you zoom on the facade, here you will see written on a billboard, material to sell, proving that it was possible at that time to bought second-hand material from demolition site. And 50 years later, because of the evolution of demoli demolition practice, Buildings were knocking down, making it impossible to reclaim elements from that building stock. The evolution of, re of recycling changed demolition practice. This is an image of Robin Hood Gardens, uh, Brutalism Architecture in London, 
demolished a few years ago. And nowadays, because of uh, recycling material, are crushed to be prepared as a new raw material. But we all know how recycling practices are disappointing, with the great loss of the energy and economy embedded in the material. And if you go through the demolition permits in a year in London, you will see a large quantity and the various type of buildings demolished with less than 1% of the material reclaimed. This is an extract of many pages. So the question is, how to reclaim building material in our construction process. So I propose you a small exercise invented by Denis Meadows. I guess you know who is uh, that scientist who wrote the Limit of Growth Report in 1970s. That exercise interrogates our habits and how it's difficult to change them. So please, I will ask to the audience to cross your arms. And now look which hand is on the top. Now uncross your arms and try to cross them in the other way. <laughs> what do you notice? It's difficult. <laughs> so now you understand how difficult is it to change your habits. But if you practice it every day, it will become easier. It is an insight of what it feels like when we try to change the rules in construction industry by designing buildings with second-hand materials. So with Rotor, we decided to start with a very pragmatical approach to solve that issue. In France, scientists and researchers were debating on how 11th century castles were built. To solve that debate, they decided to build 20 years ago, as you can see on this image, a new castle from scratch in Burgundy, using the tools, the method, and the resource of that time. The castle is almost finished yet. We do so with Rotor and build our, 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 and build our castle in Brussels in 2015. So we rent a big warehouse in the suburb and create a deconstruction company. You can see on that image the facilities with material stores on the yards, office uh, in that block, um, workshop, and uh, a showroom. But reusing building materials are not so easy. It requires few steps to put back on track the resource. This is an image of a reclamation audit, because first, you need to have a view on what is inside the building stock. And then, and then you have to understand how to dismantle it carefully. So you realize that dismantling materials takes seven times more than demolishing buildings, but also seven more laborers and workers than, a demo than on the demolition site. Then you need to extract and bring the product to the facilities. You have to process it because you can sell it with mark of glue, nails, mortar. And you also need space to store your catch. And at the end, you need to collect the information about the product, size, colors, quantity, to make, to make it accessible to the next buyer. So we've started to sell ceramic ties in Brussels that we've collected and cleaned locally and installed them in new projects. We collected also sanitary. We salvaged also more contemporary building elements, like these radiator covers coming from the renovation of office towers in Brussels, as you can see here. They are made with curved plywood that designers reuse to make new furniture, chairs, cupboards, wardrobes. We collect also glue lamp beams coming from the demolition of timber frames that we transform into tables. And at the end, we found that we save a lot of energy by reusing materials, more to using new ones. On this image, you can see the energy embedded into the extraction and the pro production process of a new material, but also the energy 
required for waste treatment that is avoided by using second-hand elements. So, the next question is, who else is able of circulating reused items? We've discovered that in every region of Europe, in Belgium, France, Netherlands, UK, there were many companies, not very visible, which proposed an offer of second-hand building element. So we decided to visit them, like this one in France, who looked look like a bit authenticity and patina business, selling old wooden floors, coming from the demolition of various buildings, barn woods, timber, old train, timber works, old trains. And it's hard to imagine the, the virgin forest store within building until they re-emerge as pieces of lumber after a century or more through the demolition process. So we found that some part of that forest was still stuck in a few reclamation yards. These old, old wooden planks came like this, with mark of wear holes. But the company is able to process it and prepare the material for a new use to be installed in a construction like this one, housing block in a design few years ago in London by famous architect. We visited some brick specialists able to collect all bricks to build new houses with it. We visited window frame resellers, proving that it's possible to renovate your house with second-hand windows, but also a lot of antiquity dealers able to design a new facade with all wooden frames for an institutional building in, in Brussels. So we decided to give them more visibility by creating an online directory called opalis.eu, where you can find a various list of reused dealers, information about their services, and type of material that are available on, on the market, with all the knowledge required to install a second-hand materials in large-scale project. So nowadays, we visited more than 900 companies in Northwestern Europe that you can find on Opalis and Salvo Web for UK. There is therefore no longer any reason to build projects with 100% of new materials. I invite you to work with these companies and integrate a part of reused material in your design. So much more companies are waiting to be visited and look forward to working with you, like these, these ones around Milano that I found this morning. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Victor, for the presentation. I hope this can inspire a lot of designers and producers that are here with us today. With the coming session, we are going to talk about design emergencies, and we will do so with the help of the great Paolo Antonelli and Alice Roster. <laughs> great. <laughs> well, for sure they don't need an introduction, but I need to do it, so I will give it a try. Paola is a senior curator of architecture and design and founding director of the research and development at MoMA in New York. Her work investigates design impact on everyday experience, often including overlooked objects and practices. Among her exhibitions are the 22nd Triennale di Milano, Broken Nature, and MoMA Material Ecology. Paola is also co-founder with Alice of Design Emergency. Alice Roster is an award-winning design critic and author whose books include Design as an Attitude and Design Emergency, Building a Better Future. A weekly design column for the New York Times was syndicated worldwide for over a decade. In all her work, Alice championed design potential as a social, political, and ecological tool. I welcome all of you on stage with Simone. Welcome. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's uh, weird to moderate the two of you, but still. You know, we haven't been together, we haven't breathed the same air in two and a half years. So even though we've been looking at each other on screen every week, it's really exciting to yeah, see. Yeah, it's <laughs> lovely to see Paola unpixelated. <laughs> <laughs> but before talking about design emergency, 
I would like to have uh, a question for each one of you because sure. I want to understand how your individual works links to design emergency. And I would like to start with Paula since, I mean, we had Broken Nature three years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, time passes by really quickly. Yep. Yep. It was a great show. Thank you. And I think there you put together an exhibition, but also some concepts that are really related to design emergency. And particularly, I'm interested in you elaborating the idea of restorative design, because I think it's brilliant. It's perfect to come right after Victor, the idea of restorative design. Well, first of all, um, it happens that, you know, I always hear the, the adage that every director always makes the same movie, and it's exactly the same story. For the past 28 years, I've been doing the same movie seen from different angles. So even Broken Nature had the same idea, that of having more respect for our resources, for other human beings, for uh, more than human entities, for everything. It's a matter of respect. And um, restorative design was a way to make that attitude of respect a little more plausible for everyone. Um, once upon a time, being responsible or between quotes sustainable meant sacrificing and atoning for past sins. So in order to be sustainable, one had to do that terrible confetti plastics to do recycling or it, it was just like a stereotype of abdication of aesthetics and abdication of pleasure and instead, I can see from everything that's been discussed here and that it's been shown here that one can be highly ethical and responsible and still give in to the kind of pleasure and delight that design affords the world, uh, both designers and customers. And so with that idea, Broken Nature was all about showing people that uh, as something can be done. It was an exhibition for citizens because it was here in Milan and it was such a gift for me to be able to work in the Triennale building where I started my whole career. And it was in Milan, therefore it was for citizens and it was about letting people know that we can all do something and we can enjoy doing it and it can be an addition to the world, not a subtraction. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, well. Which I think, I mean, I love the exhibition. It was uh, really incredible. Also, but you were also public, part of it. Well, it I'm great. not saying it for that, but I no, think I it know. was really it was important great. for also the Milanese context. I think it was really great to have that exhibition. But equally, I think this also links to your own work, Alice. And I'm thinking about Design as an Attitude, which is, has been recently republished and extended. And the reason why I think it's connected is because also there you explore an expansive idea of design. And I think I'm interested in exploring what, what actually you mean with design, with attitudinal design, and how it is differing from how generally uh, design has been described. I know it has also been, um, the book was influenced by the work of Laszlo Molinage. So can you elaborate more on this idea of attitudinal design? Sure, well the book began as a series of columns for Freeze, the contemporary art magazine, um, in which I was given carte blanche to interrogate what I felt were the key issues in design. So for me, they're the key issues in our lives, in our ecology, in our politics, in our identities. And so it looked at issues like gender identity, design's changing relationship to art, to craft, to technology, the climate emergency, the refugee crisis, and so on. And how designers were increasingly able and um, engaged in tackling those massive issues. So I needed to contextualize it. And so um, design as an attitude, the phrase is Laszlo Moulinages. It's the title of chapter two of his final book, Vision in Motion, which was published in 1947. And in it, he um, mapped what he felt were parallels between his vision of design in the future and an improvisational, um, sort of spontaneous, unknowing practice of design in the past. Because of course, design has existed for millennia, mm -hmm. long before a word was invented to describe it. And it's since meant many different things to different people in different contexts. But during the industrial age, it became stereotyped and I felt marginalized and impeded and very much um, restricted, certainly in terms of public and political perceptions, to something that was involved with styling and promotion, style rather than substance. My argument is that because of fairly basic and affordable digital technologies, which have been transformative in every field of life, they have had a really radical impact on the practice and possibilities of design. And that with the fact that we are in an age of activism, we're in an age of 
odious extremes that become ever more odious and ever more extreme. Design's not a panacea for any of the massive challenges we face, but it can be a very powerful tool with which to address them, providing it's applied intelligently, responsibly, and sensitively. And it's been great to hear so many examples of that here today. Well, being a designer myself, I would like to thank the two of you to actually be such a good advocate for design in a very uh, thoughtful way and not really related to only Well, style. I have to burst in and say without incredible designers, we'd have nothing to yeah, write exactly. about and nothing to curate. So thank you yeah. to all of yeah. you. Indeed. We're wholly dependent mm. on you. Indeed. But uh, I would like to have the slideshow possibly of design emergency on screen. Um, I have a question for the two of you, actually. But what is a design emergency? Because, I mean, <laughs> first of all, uh, even that, I think it is great how you use also Instagram as a curatorial tool, which I think it is absolutely brilliant. What is a design emergency today? Well, um, it can be a different scale. A design emergency can be minor. It can be a zip that breaks, or it can be instead the depletion of the Amazon forest. And so I'm saying this here in a kind of provocative way, but truly, there are de design emergencies of any kind. What we think is important is to recognize them and to treat them in the context that they come up in. So when uh, the pandemic began, the design emergency was enormous because design is life and life was completely disrupted. And the kind of uh, massive change that we had to go through from one day to the other needed to be understood and accommodated somehow. And it was also a design issue. Of course, it was a health issue. There were people that were uh, risking or losing their lives, losing loved ones, had to brave the subways and the tubes all over the world with contagion being at sky high. And no matter what, there was real tragedy going on. In some of our lives, the disruption was much lesser, but still, it was deep. Just to think of what happened to teenagers and young people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, we're all kind of bearing the weight right now of what happened in the past two and a half years with uh, micro or macro traumas. But uh, it's something that we needed to cope with all of a sudden. And design could help. So design emergencies are all around us. They are, who was talking yesterday about the fact that there's not only one environmental crisis, but there are many crises that are all coming together at all scales and from all sides, and they're all feeding into each other. Design is one of the tools to face them. I think Amitav was mentioning that. It was yesterday. Amitav, yes, yeah. thank you. But he was talking about somebody else. I don't remember who, who he was mentioning. And given that we're both evangelists for design, <laughs> and we hope champions of, of design, we felt that um, COVID-19 was a possibly unprecedented and unrepeatable opportunity to really crystallize our vision of design and design's efficacy in responding to these complex challenges. Because, of course, at the beginning of COVID, one of the really terrifying things is that no one knew what we were dealing with, not even the world's greatest and most eminent scientists and doctors. And very quickly, because designers responded so generously, imaginatively, courageously and resourcefully, the general media was picking up on design solutions, whether it was what ended up being a rather testosterone-charged race to build ever faster, bigger ventilators than everyone else to um, public information programs that enabled people to navigate this terrifying emergency. Um, there was a general understanding of what we were facing. And so it was, in a sense, a great opportunity to show these design solutions because people understood the urgency and they understood the practicality. And so we felt that we should initially focus design emergency on um, the design response to COVID. So we search for the global design leaders in each of the different fields. Um, but really our end game was that if you look back historically at emergencies, the really big ones, great plagues, world wars, they're almost always followed by a period of radical redesign and reconstruction. Mm. And whether that's a desperate attempt to build something good out of so much loss and destruction, or an optimistic and constructive solution. So we felt that this was bound to be the case this time. You know, we all knew we faced horrifically complex and multiple problems before COVID, but many of them accelerated during that period. And so what we really wanted to do was focus people 
on design as a tool that can help us to build a better future. So after about three months of focusing on COVID, we had a much broader focus, and this was by identifying designers who we felt were already at the forefront of meaningful change. And because we wanted to reach a, a wider audience, they were all involved in experimentation of different types, but they also had practical outputs. And so we were delivering proof to people that there was a point and a purpose in all of this. Yeah, not just theory, sorry. And so, exactly, and so we identified the sort of massive challenges of our times, and then identified the designers who we subjectively felt were responding most interestingly. So we just had Peter Barber, who's devoted a 30-year career to extraordinary social housing. AL. We're now looking at A.L. Weizmann of Was forensic here, yes, architecture, today. exactly, who invented a completely new form of design and architectural practice as a tool of restorative social justice. So um, horrific though the pandemic was for everyone, I heartily recommend probing design as a way of getting through it because you're constantly dealing with people who are optimistic, resilient, resourceful, and a delivering solutions. Fantastic. And, re and regarding Instagram, you know, Instagram, Alice owns Instagram already, right? So she was already, no, you I were already think in your series. Might be Zuckerberg, but. Well, yeah, Zuckerberg is just, uh, you know, an accessory. But it's, um, um, she was already doing a series about design in the pandemic, at the pandemic. And um, so Instagram was already her comfort zone. And as far as going to Instagram Live is concerned, it's because at the beginning of the lockdown, we were all watching yeah. Instagram Lives. Like how Larry, my husband, was watching Fat Joe. And, you know, and he said, well, you know, you could do that. And I said, Alice and I could do it. And so Alice called upon our friend Frith Kerr, who's wonderful identity graphics and fonts you see behind us. And Frith whipped up an identity literally in three days, and we started. Oh, Valdifiemme was They're just brilliant. We us. work with yeah. them. And, uh, and so it really was, everything was very natural and, uh, and a wonderful opportunity, not only to show the world the strength of design, but also to work together because we've been friends for such a long time and we've been in conferences, juries, uh, panels all over the world. We've had adventures, but we've never really started something together. So it was a wonderful opportunity for that also. But let's talk for a second about um, the subject also of Prada Frames. I'm thinking about the subject of the forest. And I think there's a few examples, actually many examples in design emergency where you address the vegetal world in different ways. And I'm thinking, for instance, Alice at the Great Green Wall of Africa, which is a fantastic initiative connected with desertification. Indeed. Well, the Great Green Wall of Africa I have been obsessed by for many years. So design emergency was yet another excuse um, to probe further and find out more about it. And I believe that um, potentially it's a model of the highly complex intersectional epic design endeavors we are going to need to crack these major problems. And in its case, it is... Um, it began with the ecological problem of drought on the southern edge of the Sahara Desert. So this is 5,000 miles, 8,000 kilometers from Senegal on the west coast um, of Africa to Djibouti on the east coast. And it was originated by the great radical revolutionary leader of Burkina Faso, Thomas Sankara, in the 1980s, but only um, actually began in 2007. It's a pan-African project, which is absolutely critical, and it's um, under the aegis of the African Union. 21 countries are involved, and their challenge is to, it's called the Great Green Wall because that conveys this sort of Disney-esque image of a wall of greenery across the southern edge of the Sahara. Um, but actually, it's all about um, land restoration. And so having seen that the severe drought in the region had triggered other ecological problems, so desertification, um, deforestation, but then massive socioeconomic problems of famine, um, mass migration, terrorism, conflict, supply problems, and so on. So the region is literally dying. It really is on the precipice of climate change as one of the hottest, driest, poorest, most fragile places on the planet. So from 2007 until the start of the pandemic, um, the Great Green Wall was nearly 20% completed, largely in Western Africa, which had been more proactive than other countries. And each country is free to interpret the brief as it wishes. Um, 
But early last year and during the course of last year, another 20 billion US dollars was raised by an international consortium led by the French government and the World Bank. And that gives the Great Green Wall a fighting chance of hitting its goals so that by 2030 it will be completed or largely completed and 10 million new green jobs will have been invented. But it also shows the perils of these hugely ambitious and complex design projects because, for example, Senegal has always been very much at the forefront with a vigorous tree planting program, as has Burkina Faso in re inventing traditional agricultural practices. But Ethiopia was also one of the most dynamic countries in the project. But then two years ago, civil war erupted and the project has stopped. been um, completely ossified there. So it will be fascinating to follow it. And it is a, a huge catalyst for hope and optimism. And we are sure that you will help us follow this project on design emergency. <laughs> Um, but in design emergency, you do not only focus on this, uh, I think, challenging and really fantastic endeavors. You also look, in a way, at practices that are closer to what generally uh, the cities is considered to be designed, but seen in a very thoughtful way. I'm thinking, for instance, at the several times you made posts about brilliant ways of applying materials. Since we are talking about wood, I'm thinking at the work of Zhu Tiantian, the Chinese architect working in rural China with bamboo. Yes, sometimes they're more intimate projects. You know, what is interesting about all these projects is that they are political, even when they are about furniture, or about old-fashioned architecture, meaning buildings. And uh, Xu Tian Tian is a really interesting architect. She studied at Tsinghua University in Beijing, then she was at Harvard for a while, um, and uh, she moved back to Beijing, worked with Ai Weiwei and other artists, and then opened her own practice called DNA Architecture. Uh, a few years ago. And she's worked mostly with her colleagues on a valley, the Songyang Valley, south of Shanghai, which is a mountainous valley of about 400 villages. And she has decided to work in this very intimate way. I mean, the choice of the attribute int intimate is really deliberate because um, every piece of architecture in this strategy, which she calls architectural acupuncture, is really pointedly for that particular village. We talked about 400 villages. Each village has its own strength. One village is famous for the production of tofu, another one for brown sugar. And every building that she designs and builds is also thought about and reasoned with the community and tends to be convertible. Like, for instance, brown sugar gets produced for several months a year, but for the rest of the year, that becomes a, a kind of like communal, communal space or the um, tofu factory is a factory that is also a performance place because families have different ways of making tofu and they do it in front of the community. There's almost like a promenade that enables people to look at how tofu is made and then elder people with young people teach them how to do it. It's this kind of dreamy rural paradise. And um, the, bamboo, the, the bamboo theater, which she's most well known for, is uh, literally a theater, a camp be a cathedral of bamboo that was put together in the span of three, four days. Because you know, bamboo grows like crazy. So she spoke with bamboo experts that just came and made almost like a ponytail of bamboo. And it has become this amazingly spectacular space where performances are organized and assemblies are, um, are also called. And it's really quite fantastic. Now, during our interview, we closed with a question. I will hold Xu Tian Tian to this question, uh, to this answer, because I asked her, uh, this is fabulous architectural acupuncture. It really is about the people, for the people. It's about converting spaces. It's about finding new ways to be together. If you were ever given as a commission a skyscraper for rich people of the kind that Andres showed before in Shanghai, would you say yes? She said no. I want to see if that happens. But even if she ever decided to go for a skyscraper, I think that this kind of attitude will stay with her. I don't think you can change that kind of attitude towards the world, because I think it's ingrained with uh, a new generation and a new mode of doing architecture and design. Incredible. I think uh, when I think about design um, that you put forward, in design emergency, uh, I think what for me is great is that it really helps in challenging the ideas, the preconceived ideas about this, uh, this discipline. 
And because there's many biases that we have to face as designers when we, when we work. And I think you had a conversation um, regarding the Isabella Tree project, uh, where there was a question also uh, regarding how, what people expect a landscape to look about, to look like. And I think this is something which is extremely interesting because uh, we as designers, we face this problem daily to have to challenge the preconceived ideas about what are the right solutions or what is the context supposed to, to be like. Can you explain the Isabella Tree project and most of all also the idea of rewilding? Well, Isabella Tree um, is an author married to a farmer, Charlie Burrell, and Charlie inherited his grandparents' farm in Sussex in southern England. So it's a, it's a large farm, uh, 3,500 acres, so just over 1,400 hectares, and um, they spent a, a decade trying and failing to make it work. And um, it was managed in accordance with the UK government's prescribed agricultural practices, but these were industrial farming practices and they were just killing everything. They were massively in debt. Um, the land was dying, the soil was degraded, and species of wildlife, flora and fauna that had lived in that environment for centuries were disappearing at an ever-increasing speed. So 20 years ago, they decided they had to make a radical change, and they decided to sort of stop trying to control the land and to allow it to control itself, which is the classic underlying principle of rewilding. So they literally stopped managing the land. I mean, this was a lengthy logistical process to, to plan for, but that was what they did. And so very quickly, the, um, the bushes, the trees, the plants, the weeds, the herbs that had been growing there rocketed up and literally enfolded the landscape. Um, and it's interesting as to whether this is a design project or not, because Isabella was slightly skeptical that it was. The Great Green Wall of Africa is a very unorthodox design project, but I believe it's a strategic design project because the underlying strategy was design. And the same is true for NEP, because had they just left the land to literally go wild and crazy and free, it would have sort of cannibalized itself or whatever was growing there would have done. So they reintroduced sort of contemporary versions of the massive beasts that had roamed there in medieval times. So English longhorn cattle, sturdy little Exmoor ponies, Paola's personal favorites, the super cute Tamworth pigs. <laughs> and um, so they basically, they shit all over the land and so they're fertilizing it and they're moving seeds from area to area. They're also thrashing down undergrowth that's growing and stopping other things from breaking through. So very quickly, the species that had left NEP began going back there. So they'd have all of these sightings, you know, peregrine falcons, white storks, um, purple emperor, king emperor butterflies, and, and so on. And Isabella wrote a wonderful book about it for adults called Wilding, and brilliantly one for kids called Let's Go Wild, and what kid <laughs> could possibly not want their own rewilding project after reading that. And um, so it really became a model of rewilding, but I think largely because Isabella and Charlie are so pragmatic in the way they analyze it and so generous in sharing their learnings, even um, their one most conspicuous failure, which was they were desperate to introduce beavers because of their damming skills. Apparently, um, after first elephants, second humans, beavers have the greatest impact on their habitat of any species, wow. according to Isabella. So they set up what they thought would be the optimal area for beavers. Um, they lasted two days before they scarpered by racing up the river. One was found um, 50 kilometers away, and it had got there in 10 days. Um, so they're revisiting that. But the biggest problem, other than escaping beavers, was the attitude of local people, because our Disney-esque version of what a natural countryside, a natural environment should be like is so pervasive that when this sort of thorny scrub reappeared, local people were horrified. They associated it not with love and caring and dedication, but with neglect. Paula, Ellis, really thank you for being thank part you. of the oh, session. Thank you. This is fantastic. Thank you.